50 years ago, Dr. Martin Luther King inspired and challenged Americans to end racism with his I Have a Dream speech. Five decades later, has his dream come true? Has progress been made? Or would Dr. King be disappointed? It's Your Call revisits the dream and invites you to join in with your thoughts and opinions, and it all begins right now. It was an eerily familiar scene. Tens of thousands of people on the square in the nation's capital listening intently to the words of its civil rights leaders. They were calling for an end to racism, equal opportunities for all, and peaceful coexistence. In 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King spoke to a capacity crowd and challenged the nation then with those same goals during his now iconic I Have a Dream speech. This hour, we'll talk to folks who were there 50 years ago, as well as to some who were at the commemorative services as we revisit Dr. King's dream. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. It's good to have you with us. I am Lynn Doyle. This hour, we invite you to share your memories of Dr. King's message, whether you heard it originally 50 years ago or whether you grew up with it. You can start emailing me right now at lynn at lynndoyle.net. In just a moment, we'll meet three people who attended the 50th anniversary celebration to hear what it was like to stand in the shadow of history. But first, we go to the telephone lines, where we're joined by Harris Wofford, a former U.S. Senator from Pennsylvania who was a friend and unofficial advisor to Dr. King. He was also President Kennedy's special assistant on civil rights. Senator, thank you so much for joining us. Well, I'm glad to be with you in part, and I wish you were hearing the whole of your good show. Thank you so much. You've said that being involved with the civil rights movement was the biggest adventure of your life. How do you think your friend Dr. King would characterize the status of his dream today? I think he would realize that history uh, has been made very much the way the president so well outlined the tragic and triumphant history of those great years, the Climax of it, you could say, was the march on Washington. Uh, just two months before, the president, uh, Kennedy, had finally decided the time had come, partly in response to the Birmingham civil rights struggle led by Dr. King. Uh, he, he, uh, Martin Luther King said when he heard Kennedy in, in, in the spring of 1963, Go to the nation say, saying, this is a moral issue as clear as the scripture and is as, as, as old as the scripture, scriptures and as clear as the Constitution and called for a full-throated civil rights bill. Right. That made the possibility of this march being such a triumphant and happy one. If that had not happened, uh, it could have been an angry march. And in but fact, this it was, was a march not. where... The, the words "we shall overcome" had real power because the, the the public protests of the great movement of civil rights had been met by public power or the call to action from Senator, the executive branch. Did you or he realize at the time the impact that his words would have on generations? I think it's one of those moments when some people missed it. The Gettysburg Address, a lot of people didn't realize it was one of the great addresses in history until they thought about it later. I think most people who really listened to that, uh, those uh, words of Martin Luther King realized they were hearing words like the Declaration of Independence and the Gettysburg Address, historic words. But some may have missed it, but they, in due course they learned. And, Senator, do you think that the country is going to move forward and have another Martin Luther King in its future? Well, I think that you uh, need to both realize that the two great goals that were, were, were set up by Dr. King and the civil rights movement, winning the right to vote and ending public segregation, were achieved. Uh, the right to vote is being chipped away in small ways that need to be stopped. But the, those rights were achieved. But King was p most powerful in saying before he was killed that he had seen the promised land, but he might not make it because there are more mountains to climb right. and of race and poverty meeting in the urban condition. And we have not done uh, what he would have liked to have had us done and what we might have done if he had lived uh, in these last years. 
you know, on the other mountains that need to be climbed, but particularly poverty, which is what the president called us to look at and act on uh, with great power yesterday. All right, Senator, thank you so much for joining us. I certainly appreciate your perspective on this. It's always wonderful well, to talk to you. Your perspectives are always very lively and important. <laughs> thank you. We'll see you soon. Now, joining Senator yesterday at the 50th anniversary of the Dream speech were our next guests, including Chad Dion Lassiter, who's a national expert on race relations and the president of Black Men at Penn at the University of Pennsylvania School of Social Policy and Practice. Bernice Jean-Louis is the state president of the Pennsylvania Youth and College Division of the NAACP. And Todd Bernstein is the president of Global Citizen, a nonprofit organization which promotes sustainable civic engagement through volunteer service locally and globally. You also know him as the director and founder of the Greater Philadelphia Martin Luther King Day of Service. Good to have you three with us to start this show. And Todd, I want to start with you because I know that Senator Wofford was a mentor to you. Yeah, absolutely. And that Dr. Martin Luther King and his legacy have, has, have been a priority in your life. What was it like to stand in the shadow of history? Well, I was there with Harris. And, um, you know, I think it was a time to reflect and um, take stock of, of the great accomplishments. And as Harris pointed out, the, the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act were, were incredibly important. But the irony of all of that is one just needs to take a look at the last few months. And voting rights are being chipped away uh, with the Pennsylvania voter ID law. Um, the Supreme Court just struck down uh, an important section of the Civil Rights Act. And um, so I think it underscores the fact that while we've made strides forward, there is a, a lot yet to be accomplished. And I wanted to turn to Chad to get his perspective on what does need to be accomplished. You heard me ask at the top of the show whether or not Dr. King would be disappointed. In your opinion, would he be pleased with the progress of the last five decades, or would he say, boy, we still have a long way to go? Being a student of the philosophical teachings of Dr. King, I think he would lend a spiritual pause and he would get in prayer about where we are. I think ultimately he would look at it as a dream deferred that we have come a long way but we still have not made progress as it relates to being a tolerant country. I think he would be saddened by stop and frisk, the mass incarceration rate. Towards the end of his life he was a vocal, uh, outspoken individual as it relates to the military industrial complex. So I think that Dr. King would have some pervasive challenges as it relates to drones being sent all over the world. I think also when we look at the Voting Rights Act as being chipped away and the way we discriminate against individuals from an immigration standpoint, all these things would be intersected and Dr. King would be vocal about that. And yet did both of you feel somewhat empowered being there on the, the um, nation's capital, at the nation's capital? And, and hearing those words again in the same setting where he spoke them first 50 years ago? For me, it was about paying respect to not only Dr. King, but all of those on every side of the color line and gender line who got us to that point. But I think I'm empowered every single day by the works of Dr. King and others, the work that Ty Bernstein and many of us are doing here in the city of Philadelphia. So being there in the moment, it was advantageous, it was nostalgic, but it wasn't something where I was like, oh, this particular talk is gonna get me to a point of trying to transform my community. We do that any day. That's your goal. Yeah, I, what, what Chad said is correct. Um, I think that everyone there was uh, willing to celebrate in the moment. But no one was under the illusion that we're in a post-racial society or, or that we've made the kind of uh, strides where we can go home and uh, rest. Uh, Dr. King was a man of action 365 days of the year, and that's really what, what we have to do as well. Bernice, why was it important for you to attend this 50th anniversary of the I Have a Dream speech? Well, for me, as the president of the Youth and College Division, it was important because I wanted to be able to take part in this historic um, event. Yes, 50 years ago, they did march and gave us the opportunity for for myself, for example, to go to college and not have to worry about, um, you know, the racism that happened back then. So for me, that's why it was important. Just being able to be there with um, those who marched before me and just we're all coming together for the same, you know, Goal. Right, same goal. And you saw a lot of people of a lot of different ages, yes. all races, all religions, all ethnicities. Um, it was just, it, for you, was was it, as I asked before, empowering? What, what, How would you characterize what it was like for you? It was very empowering because um, on our way down to the National Mall, we actually sat next to an elder lady who was um, a member of the North Carolina NAACP branch, and she was, you know, reflecting on 
where she where we have come from before and where we are now so for us as the youth in college it was um, just the youth in college of pennsylvania and the youth in college of other states it's empowering for me because we are all coming together as youth as they did back in 1963 and still fighting for the same thing and we're not giving up because the, the responsibility fight is still there. has now been handed to your generation exactly. to move forward with it we're going to invite our viewers to be part of this conversation if you'd like to join in and tell us what you recall about hearing those words for the first time or what impact it's had on you over the years you can do so by emailing me at lynn at lynndoyle.net our next guest is harold jack and he's a Pulitzer Prize winner, and he's the editorial page editor for the Philadelphia Inquirer. He's covered the civil rights movement throughout his career. He's joining the discussion now. It's great to have you here as well. Thank you, Lynn. So how would you summarize the events of the 50th anniversary of the, of the I Have a Dream speech? Yeah, well, it was important as uh, a call for people to remember the history of this country. I think that too often now, the, the events that are occurring now are, are not in context. We have people who are saying there is no reason to do anything for African Americans because they've already arrived. They don't have the history. Uh, the March on Washington, for me, is an event that was sandwiched between two events that occurred in Birmingham during my lifetime. I grew up in Birmingham. Dr. King came there in May of 1963. He led the children's marches that got recognized across the country that led to the 1964 Voting Rights Act. After the march, we had the 16th Street Church bombing in Birmingham. Uh, four little girls killed one who attended my elementary school. So those things actually stand out stronger to me than the march, but it's what occurred in between those two events in Birmingham. We're gonna talk further about that in just a moment, but I do have to take a break. We wanna include you in our discussion as well. So as I said, please respond to these questions. How do you think Dr. King's speech impacted you throughout your life? Do you think that his dream has come true or do you think very little has changed in 50 years? If you wanna join in, email me directly at lynn at lynndoyle.net or find us on Facebook or Twitter. We'll be back in two minutes. You are looking at video of Dr. Martin Luther King as we are talking about the 50th anniversary of his now iconic and historic I Have a Dream speech. We're giving you an opportunity to weigh in and tell us what you think about it, how it impacted your life as we revisit his dream here on this edition of It's Your Call. I'm Lynn Doyle. We're so glad to have you with us. In just a moment, we're going to share a story with you that you may not be familiar with. Do you know that a Westchester, Pennsylvania native was one of the architects of that famous march? In just a few minutes, we're going to be talking with Michael Long, who is the biographer of Bayard Rustin. He was an original, original civil rights leader. Right now, though, we have people who are involved in the civil rights movement today who have been involved for many Many, many years of their lives and we're talking about the impact of, of Doctor's King, Dr. King's speech. You know, I think it's interesting when you're a, a student of history to realize that his speech, number one, was only 17 minutes long compared to some of the speeches that are given today and that the part that is perhaps most famous was ad-libbed, improvised, essentially. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it, it wasn't actually ad-libbed. I mean, he had actually delivered it before, but was prompted at the end to, you know, tell us about the dream. Um, but you're right, uh, it, was a, it was a much longer speech, and there are parts of it that had almost greater impact on me when he, when he talked about how the, the architects of the, um, the Constitution and Declaration of Independence had, had promised this sort of sense of, of equality through the promissory note, and that, and that we have really not lived up to it, that it really should be marked insufficient funds. Um, and I think that was, that was part of the catalyst to, to empower people then, and I think many of those words uh, can be applied today and, and can empower us uh, um, as we speak. You know, it's interesting because we hear that speech now, we read those words, and, and I'm touched by it. I grew up in that era. But it was also a concern that it might actually premeditate some more violence, or even though the, the march itself was nonviolent. And in fact, that's exactly what happened in Birmingham well, later. That's, that's true. You know, the, the powers that be tried to pre prevent the march from occurring. They finally concurred, the march occurred, uh, it went off peacefully. But there were people who were paying attention, racists who responded in a violent fashion. And as I alluded to earlier, uh, the 16th Street church bombing was a result of that. Ku Klux Klansmen uh, set dynamite at this church before Sunday school. Four little girls were killed, three 13-year-olds, one 11-year-old. Uh, it was a heinous crime. 
And uh, really, that probably was the seminal event that led to the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, even more so than the March on Washington. And I think that's what's unique about King, is that it's not just I have a dream speech. Some great speeches have emerged from King, breaking silence, why I opposed the Vietnam uh, War, the letter from a Birmingham jail where King is speaking to his oppressors in a philosophical and an intellectual and a spiritual manner. And even with this I have a dream speech, how we are able to take some of those things and look at some of the teachings of King so that we can create that beloved community. And that's why I saw Saturday. So I commend the youth division of the NAACP. I saw the beloved community, uh, whether it's gay, lesbian, transgender, individuals coming from all over the United States of America and outside of the country trying to do what King asked us to do, which was life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing to help others? To turn this country around from intolerance to tolerance. Do you feel that you live, Bernice, in a tolerant society? Yes. Um, they allow a lot to go on. For example, the stop, whole stop and frisk and them chipping away at the voter rights. Um, that's going on. And if we do not step up and take that stand to fight against that, it is going to happen. But it's going to take us stepping up to do so. All right, I'm going to go back to our telephone lines now. We do invite you to join in and tell us what you think. But right now we're going to speak with Michael Long, who teaches at Elizabethtown College in Pennsylvania. He is the editor of I Must Resist, Bayard Rustin's Life and Letters. Michael, it's good to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. Great to be here, Lynn. Explain for us the role that Mr. Rustin played in the original march on Washington. Uh, Bayard was the principal organizer of the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. He had eight weeks to organize it. He was a brilliant organizer, and uh, he did it in part because Martin Luther King and others needed him so desperately. Bayard once said that, I love Dr. King, but really he couldn't organize a couple of vampires to go to a bloodbath, and that gives <laughs> us some indication of uh, Bayard Rustin's gifts. He really could organize, and that's what King tapped into. Now, Rustin was part of the 1940s. 41 uh, March on Washington movement that A. Philip Randolph had uh, started, and R Randolph and Rustin together worked together on the 1963 March. Yes. And I'm sorry, Michael, I think we're having some difficulty with our telephone lines, but I do appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk with you. I hope that you'll stand by. It's interesting because his is not a name that it comes right to the forefront of, of our knowledge unless you're in the business like yeah. you are. <laughs> but there are other names that, that we associate with the civil rights movement perhaps more prominently. He was a person that uh, Dr. King kept hidden because of his, his background. He was known as being a homosexual, uh, linked to the Communist Party, and uh, it would have been detrimental to King to have Rustin play a prominent role, at least publicly, in the leadership, and so he kept him somewhat hidden. But that's the amazing thing about the movement is that we know that it wasn't just Dr. King. He was in the forefront. He was this bright intellect. He was pragmatic. He was charismatic. Uh, he comes out of that black church tradition. But then you had A. Philip Randolph. What's also not really discussed is the fact that women's voices at that particular time were silenced. And women were not allowed to actually speak in the manner that they should have been able to speak because a lot of women had a lot of positive things to say about the movement or what direction to go into. So we need to also look at the sexism at that time at that particular movement and how some of those individuals who were major speakers will say that they were feminists, uh, you know, or feminist supporters, but they were anything but. And so we've come a long way in that regard where we're not silencing voices, but we still have a lot more work to do. And I think just being a student of Martin Luther King, and I think Todd will echo these same sentiments, that Taylor Branch has a three-part volume on Martin Luther King, and people really need to read that so that they don't take out of context who King was. They can read it for themselves, some of the other works that are out there on Dr. King. And then there's a beautiful collection that's at Stanford University uh, that just has all the papers of Dr. King. Read his dissertation. Read some of the things that he did at Crozier Theological Seminary right here, not too far from us, in Chester, PA. All right. Good advice there. Good suggestions. I actually have read the three-parter, and I, wow. I have to say I'm very impressed with it. I learned a lot of it. I'm going to go back to the line where Michael is uh, waiting for us. I, finally, I just wanted to ask you what you think Mr. Rustin's um, thoughts would be now some 50 years later. Would he be pleased with the progress that America's made, or would he, like so many people, agree that there's still more to be done? 
Well, Rustin grew up in the Jim Crow era, and he never uh, diminished the great contributions that the civil rights movement made to eradicating racial uh, injustice. At the same time, he was a great labor leader focused on economic justice, as few civil rights leaders were throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And I believe that he would look at the Great Recession that we've just gone through and be very disappointed at the economic injustices suffered by not only African Americans, but uh, minorities and poor whites across the across the board right. and so he would really be focusing on that Lynn all right Michael Long thank you so much we appreciate it the name of the book is I must resist Bayard Rustin's life in letters thank you so much for being with us we're gonna take a short break and when we come back we'll have some final thoughts about the dream 50 years later You are looking at a passage from the iconic uh, I Have a Dream speech by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It was given on August 23rd, 1963, where he says, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. So I'm putting the challenge out to our viewers. Finish that sentence in 2013. Finish the I have a dream and tell me what it is. Email me at lynn at lindoyle.net. I'm going to put that same challenge out to our guest here. Bernice, I'm going to start with you. You're the, you're the youngest on our panel here. Finish that sentence for me. What is your dream? I have a dream that. I have a dream that the youth and the adult um, of this age will be able to come together and work together to continue to fulfill Martin Luther King's dream. That's an excellent dream to have. We, we hope that you'll be able to achieve it. Todd, what about you? Um, a dream of mine uh, would um, heed the words of the president um, last week at the Lincoln Memorial. He said that um, uh, change doesn't come from Washington, it comes to Washington. And while we talk about the great problems of society, we need to turn words into action. People need to run for office. Uh, people need to act both individually and collectively. And uh, we can't leave it either to government or to the other guy to help solve some of these pressing challenges. And perhaps we need to make some changes so that people with good character and content of character would be interested in running for office. Harold, how would you finish that sentence? Well, I would finish it. I have a dream that people will remember their history. There are problems within the African American community, health, education, crime, poverty, the roots of those problems are in slavery and segregation. And people want to divorce that from the reality that it is and pretend that these things happen because people aren't pulling themselves up by their bootstraps. People are trying hard, but it's hard to escape history and people need to remember that. All right, and Chad? I would borrow from King. Uh, I would say that I have a dream that one day the moral arc of the universe will bend towards justice, but it would only do that if we're engaged in fighting for social justice and we need a coalition just like you had with the Jewish and white freedom riders who went down south and intersected with Africans, African Americans, they were called Negroes at that time. And that's what I have a dream, that one day America will live out its true principles of re and the reality of social justice for all humanity and we stop looking at some as civilized, uncivilized, and that the killings of folk like Oscar Grant and Trayvon Martin won't happen, that we'll be tolerant to see the full humanity of black males and Latino males in our society. All right. Thank you very much on that note. I thank you all so much for being with us. It was wonderful to have this opportunity to have this discussion with you. And as always, we'd like to know what you think. So if you were unable to get through, you'd like to email us or you have a comment or a question for any of the panelists, please email me at lynn at lynndoyle.net. Until then, my thanks to my crew and to you for watching. And we certainly hope that Dr. King's dream comes true.